Uh, it really, the, the, the peak, the summit of Jewish mystical uh, creativity um, uh, as, as it uh, reached, its, uh, reached that zenith in uh, late 13th century, early 14th century uh, Spain, Castile. Um, which was a period of time in which some of the most important works of, um, of what we uh, call Jewish mysticism or what the uh, practitioners of the material called Kabbalah or Torah Tasso, literally meaning reception or tradition, um, Torah Tasso being the, the wisdom or the teaching about the secret or the hidden mysteries. Um, so in that sense, it, it represents kind of the, um, the crown jewel, if you will, of, um, of, the whole phenom of the whole genre and phenomenon of, um, of Jewish mysticism, uh, a form of Jewish uh, thinking and imagination and practice uh, that, uh, that sought uh, first and foremost to um, argue for and uncover what it believed to be, what practitioners and thinkers believed to be the, uh, the deepest mysteries of divine existence as they are reflected, encoded, uh, layered in uh, the sacred text of the Torah and the larger Tanakh, um, and by and and then and then and then even more so, or not even more so, then also in the you might say the texture in the in the in the very uh, fabric of uh, being all around, right? That is to say, uh, all the elements of the natural world were understood to be illusions and reflections of deeper divine uh, meaning for the Kabbalists and specifically for the Zohar, for the authors of the Zohar. In the language of the Zohar, uh, Alma Tata'a Kegavna de Alma de la Eila, is in the in the in the uh, Aramaic of the Zohar, the world below our world exists on the model of the world on high. That is to say, the world uh, of divinity. Um, so that is to say that the uh, that these Jewish mystics, these Kabbalists, believed that by contemplating, by experiencing, by interpreting the world around them their own bodies, their own inner lives, the, 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 um, the, the natural world around them in all of its, uh, in all of its panoramic um, and beautiful detail, uh, the, the Torah in all its specificity and all of its mitzvot, all of its commandments, its rituals and, um, and uh, ethical injunctions um, and, um, and guidance, all of these uh, elements were understood to, to not only have um, their seemingly straightforward um, plain meaning or literal meaning, but also a deeper symbolic um, meaning of mystery or a hidden meaning, a, a, a sod, a secret, not just a secret in the sense of that I keep a secret from you, right? That it's something that I don't tell you in kind of social sense of keeping a secret, but, but the secret in the sense of the realm of the hidden, the realm of the mysterious, the, the deeper realm of reality that lies beneath the surface of perception. So the, the mystics, the Kabbalists, um, really, throughout the throughout the history of the Jewish people, though though it starts to be called Kabbalah in medieval uh, Europe, um, and and so we're specifically talking about about the Middle Ages, really in 13th century uh, um, um, Europe, uh, understood and believed that um, that nothing is as it seems. Right, that th that the world around us, that reality as we perceive it, um, is but a garb, is but a um, springboard for the spiritual imagination to uncover the deep, the deeper meanings and reverberations of 
uh, divine reality. Right? So to encounter the world roundabout is, fun is fundamentally to, uh, to go on a kind of pilgrimage of the mind into the divine um, reality and the divine uh, realm and to discover the Sitre Torah, the secrets of the Torah, the hidden meanings and mysteries of the Torah, the Razin de Oraita, as the Zohar would say in its Aramaic, the mysteries and secrets of the Torah, uh, which, which uh, lead uh, the uh, practitioner, the devotee, uh, into a kind of consciousness awareness of, um, of the divine. Um, so, the, so, um, so, so Kabbalah really was already flourishing as a form of Jewish mysticism, a form of Jewish mysticism um, that uh, with, with many different aspects to it, but, uh, but at its core, uh, at, least as, at least in the context of what we're talking about, uh, was a mythology, a, a, a theology in which God was understood to be made up of a, un a unified, interconnected series of streams of divine light, 10 rivers of energy that are inextricable one from the other, just like uh, all the waters of the world are connected as one. They may seem to be one river here and one stream here and one lake and one ocean here, but really it's all interconnected. So this was crucial for the Kabbalists and fundamentally a kind of theology uh, grounded in this uh, view of God as made up of these 10 streaming um, sources of energy that are all uh, one. And this really flourishes from the late, uh, late 12th century in southern France in Provence and then eventually uh, really flowers in um, northern uh, Spain in the 13th century, uh, throughout the 13th century, culminating um, uh, in, in this, in this uh, towering achievement of the Zohar, which scholars now believe was likely written uh, over a period of 50 or 60 years even, from, perhaps from the year 1270 to 1330. There's some debate about all of that. Uh, a lot of it was probably written in the, in the last decades of the 1200s um, in Northwestern um, uh, Iberia or what is now called Spain, the, the, the Kingdom of Castile. Now, why is the Zohar significant, right? So, so, the, so the Zohar, um, uh, so, uh, the Zohar sought to represent itself as a work of classic rabbinic literature, right? From its very beginning, it presented itself as the work of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, the, uh, the great uh, Tanaitic master, right, of, of, um, of the second century. Right and um, and and sought to uh, sought to pass itself off, though that has a pejorative ring to it, um, as an ancient work to be uh, revered. An ancient uh, midrash was was often referred to in the early literature as midrasho shel Rashbi, midrasho shel Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, the midrash of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, and. The, and and uh, in so doing, the Zohar presents itself as uh, as weaving between several, a couple of different genres, but to the two main genres being one, a, a series of a series of fragmentary tales about Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, the master, and his disciples wandering about the ancient Galilee in quest of mystical wisdom. Uh, and this was, and this is part of what I discussed in my, in the, in the first book on, on, on the sub, on the subject, um, the art of mystical narrative. This was really a product of the fictional imagination of these medieval Spanish Jewish mystics, right? Because they were reinventing. This was not, um, this was not something that you could find 
in the historical archives of the rabbinic period, so to speak, right? And uh, e even if you could find it in ancient, in, in Midrashic and Talmudic literature, there's also debate among scholars of rabbinic literature is how true those stories are anyway. But, but in this case, characters that are found in that rabbinic literature, um, some that are found, some that are completely invented out of whole cloth, uh, become the fictional characters, though they are presented as real characters, going on this journey for mystical wisdom, encountering wise strangers who reveal um, surprisingly uh, powerful uh, mystical wisdom, encountering seeming simpletons who turn out to be uh, the, the wisest of them all, uh, young a young child who turns out to be a greater mystical prodigy than, than all of them, and uh, and so on. Uh, so it's filled with the, with this with this kind of spirit of the of the tale of the mystical um, the mystical uh, romance, if you will, right? The journey and the quest. And this uh, and and on this quest, these different characters will will uh, frequently pause and uh, engage in a series of. Uh, pseudo dialogues, right? There re really are a, a series of monologues in some respect, right? As a kind of a nod to um, Bachtain, if, if anybody's familiar with with uh, with his his literary theory, right? So, in other words, that it was le it's often less about, let's say, an organic um, inter dialogic interaction between the characters, and more that they are each speaking a series of soliloquies to, uh, or a series of speeches that are um, often um, mystical midrashim, right? They're, they seek to present themselves as, seek to present themselves as ancient midrash, um, but it's an ancient midrash that is unlike any ancient midrash that was known before, right? It, it, it actually is, um, Kabbalistic discourse in midrashic garb. Um, so, so the other major genre you can say of, of the Zohar is its midrashic, midrashic uh, these midrashic uh, um, excurses, which are um, <clears throat> uh, very often deeply mythological, um, deeply theological, and symbolic. And um, as I will argue in the book and as we'll study together, are also often highly uh, poetic and lyrical, right? So that's, that is part of where both in, terms, both in terms of the kinds of ways that the characters speak to one another in the course of embedded within some of the tales, but then also as they are speaking and starting to expound upon mystical wisdom in a kind of exegetical, right, interpretive, uh, homiletical, right, as a, as a kind of the way a sermon would unfold, midrashic mode, they um, weave together a grand um, mythos, a grand myth, a grand um, world of, of supernatural reality about the inner life of God. And in so doing, they express themselves with um, a striking, um, a strike, striking techniques of poesis, of, of, po of poetry making, right, and, and uh, lyricism. Um, also, uh, also worthy of, um, of note in this, in this uh, respect, and let me just take a dramatic pause to get a sip of water. that dramatic enough? Um, uh, and, and also to just to, um, uh, to emphasize that the Zohar, unlike its contemporaneous Kabbalistic literature, was written in Aramaic as opposed to in a literary Hebrew, which was, which was um, almost exclusively the language that was used um, pretty much exclusively by other Kabbalists of the time. So in writing in, in, writing in Aramaic and essentially a kind of newfangled 
uh, and and highly highly poetic and lyrical and creative and inventive Aramaic, draw, drawing on older forms of Aramaic from the Talmud Bavli, from the Targumim, from Midrashim, from their own imagination, um, basically creating a new kind of mystical language, which um, itself, I um, would argue, and other scholars have argued, functions as itself a kind of cloak for the poetic nature of the text, right? Because for a variety of reasons, uh, one, uh, it cloaks it in, a, in, in the very mystery that it seeks to evoke, right? Because, the, because Aramaic at the time, unlike the time when uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, would have actually been living, right, and, and in the centuries before, was not the spoken language, um, right, that was a spoken language back, um, uh, back then. So, you could, so you, could, you could say that there was almost an attempt to try to recapture some of that, though, though mystical texts at the time would not have been um, written in this kind of an Aramaic. Um, because it because it was a more uh, popular language. Right? This was the language of Jesus and his disciples, and so forth. Um, so the so the Aramaic of the Zohar is a kind of cloak of mystery. We could say that if, that create that that in and of itself creates a kind of texture of religious experience and a kind of sense of the wonder and mystery of God and the mysteries of the universe. Right, just through its very, just through its very language. Um, so this is so the Aramaic nature of the Zohar is very is very significant, and um, and also made the Zohar for a very long time, and still, uh, th uh, though it's made easier now with various um, translations that have that have been accomplished in recent years first first in hebrew and then in and, and now in english with the with the very important uh, daniel matt um, english translation um, the aramaic nevertheless remained a kind of if not impenetrable remained a kind of cloak of elusiveness right both allusive in the sense of alluding to and elusive in the sense of it it's slipping away from the mind because it has it has that texture of mystery um to it and and as 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 i'm going to um as i'm going to discuss uh some um the the very nature of zoharic aramaic can be characterized as one of the dimensions of its poetic um, of its uh, poetic character. Um, so so um, so let's so, so let's let's let so now that we've now that we've set the table a little bit in terms of that, um, let me present to you a few observations about what, uh, what we can characterize as main elements of what of, of what we can call the mystical poetry of the Zohar, the this prose poetry of the Zohar. Of course, there's a great tradition of Jewish poetry in the Middle Ages, right? A grand tra tradition, um, uh, some uh, especially from late antiquity in Ar in Aramaic as well, but but uh, but mostly in um, in in a in a, in a uh, um, uh, a highly elegant uh, Hebrew, but but in but in those in those contexts, um, the verse was highly deliberate, metered, and uh, and and was uh, followed certain conventions of um, of verse poetry. Whereas the Zohar, I think, uh, is best characterized as a kind of prose poetry. Um, and we'll see uh, in, in some of the in some of the texts that that uh, you'll have in front of you. The, in the translations, they've been broken up first in the in the work of Matt uh, that, you, that you'll see there, and then in some of my translations of other texts, 
in ways that look like they were written as verse, right? But that's really actually the invention of the translators, in that case, Matt, and then and, and then myself, right? Um, uh, which which is which is a little bit of sleight of hand, I suppose, right? Um, uh, but is but but is meant itself as a kind of interpretive move, right? It's to say that read this as you would read poetry. Um, so, so the first question to ask, really, with respect to the Zohar um, uh, in, um, uh, in this sense is, um, what are the commonalities uh, between uh, mysticism and, uh, and poetry? Right? Why? Why is there this this deep? Uh, why is there this deep uh, connection uh, between uh, between the two? Um, and to approach uh, to approach this question, uh, right? In that in that sense, um, to approach this question um, to, to to a certain extent, I want to, I want to evoke uh, the typology or the way of dividing it that was that was developed by uh, the great anti-Semite Ezra Pound. Um, uh, this is, uh, you'll, you'll excuse me, uh, but it, it, uh, it had, had an important uh, um, influence on the history of literary criticism. Uh, that being um, this kind of tripartite art of poetry, that of poetry as sound, poetry as image, and poetry as thought or conceptual stimuli. Poetry as sound, poetry as image, and poetry as thought or conceptual um, uh, stimuli. Right? Um, but even before, so even before we get to that, uh, just just to say that I that I that the the commonality, the, the way in which the Zohar functions as a kind of mystical poetry, is um, I I argue is as as a kind of literature of um, the spiritual sublime, literature of the spiritual sublime. Um, what and what do I mean uh, by by that? Right, this is a this is a category in the study of philosophy, in the study of art, in the study of literature. Um, for our purposes, um, and the way in which it, it was understood by a number of important critics and philosophers, um, is to say that it evokes some some of the dimension of the mysterious and the ineffable. Right. In other words, it's language that points beyond itself, right? Or it, it evokes a kind of mysterious texture like the, the, clo the cloak of the Aramaic itself, the very nature of the text, um, uh, I, I would suggest leads the reader toward a kind of consciousness of Mist of, of mystification and going beyond ordinary language, right? Beyond rationality, beyond reasoned language into this realm of, um, of a kind of unknowing, right? So, so if we say oftentimes that uh, some poetry, right, it, it sounds confusing or it sounds mystifying or I don't know what in the world is going on in this poem or it seems cryptic, right? To some extent, um, th these critics would argue that that, that is exactly the point of, 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 of one dimension of poetry is to take you beyond an ordinary experience of language. It's to take you beyond an ordinary experience of language, right? Instead of experiencing language in the way in which we speak it or in the way in which we think about it in prose terms or in rational terms, it takes it to this artistic level of the ineffable, right? The unspeakable, the indescribable, the mysterious. And this is significant because this was this was a this this became this was a whole genre of 
of art and of romanticism um, and of um, and of of uh, aesthetics more broadly. So, so I would say um, uh, to to give it a little bit of a, 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 a catchy phrase or a catchy phrase if you're an academic that the Zohar is a kind of uh, mystical lyric of the sublime, a mystical lyric of the sublime, right? Insofar as it, um, insofar as one of the core elements of its poetic character is to transport the reader to a different plane of mind and consciousness that lies beyond ordinary thinking and language, okay? Um, the, uh, to go back to, to Pound's um, understanding of poetry, right? The, the, the Zohar, the Zohar um, is poetic in the sense that it utilizes sound and rhythm, right? And that a lot of that has to do with the very nature of the text, right? That it, that it's, it's through the, through its, its use of open vowel sounds, its use of, um, of creative new types of words that it brings one um, into a kind of sense of the musicality of poetry, right? If we can say that poetry is a kind of music, then the Zohar also can be understood in that sound sense of Pound's um, tripartite nature of poetry as a kind of music. Um, the Zohar is deep in its, its use of imagery and rich in its use of imagery in the sense that, that um, I had one scholar described the Zohar as a kind of um, a Jewish mythic iconography or a kind of attempt to um, create an aesthetics of the visual in a culture that was so deeply an iconic, right? So that's so that's had such an ambivalent relationship toward images. So, in other words, instead of painting a grand painting um, uh, or sculpting a grand um, uh, ca uh, cathedral, though the authors of the Zohar likely passed the exteriors of cathedrals on their way to Mincha and the towns of Guadalajara and Leon and so forth. That's another discussion to have, that the Zohar should be understood as a kind of aesthetics of image, um, because the imagery is deeply rich, both in its use of descriptions of color and um, uses of the natural world to, to construct metaphors and symbols. Um, um, and, uh, and, and so on. And then in terms of thought, uh, that the Zohar seeks to uh, evoke this different plane of thinking, this different understanding of the inner mysteries um, uh, of, uh, of uh, divinity. Um, so there's, there's a lot more to talk about uh, there, but I think um, I, I, want, I want to turn us now to, um, even though the Zohar seeks us to move us beyond the concrete, uh, let's take it to uh, something a little bit more concrete with, uh, with some words of, um, of uh, text. Um, and, um, and, and let's actually begin with the, with the second PDF that you received, which is a series of, of um, of uh, my of my translations, which which eventually appeared actually this is um, uh, eventually appeared in in uh, in, in, a, in printed form in the Art of Mystical Narrative, Place of the Czar, as you can see there, printed uh, published in two thousand um, uh, eighteen. Um, so so let me just let's let's actually just begin with um, text number two, just to give you a sense of um, here, here is something actually that is not so much uh, what scholars of Kabbalah love to say is not so sephirotic, right? It's not so much about the sephirot, right? Um, it's not so much, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the deepest element of what's going on here, but it really is a kind of description of, 
a kind of almost a kind of celestial metaphysical evocation of an experience of sunset. And it's and 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 this is done uh, with mythic overtones, but I believe in a way, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, in a way uh, that shows the Zoharic poetry at work. And you, and you can really feel this even in, I think, the English translation, though this, you also have uh, the original Aramaic on the right-hand side for, the, for you um, Zoharic Aramaic aficionados. I know there's at least uh, one of you out there. Um, okay. Um, so, um, so uh, all right. So, so in, in order to uh, vary, um, sounds of voice a little bit maybe somebody would like to volunteer number two this is the text that begins it has been taught and rabbi elazar said rabbi uh, uh, elazar um, uh, by the way is one of the main characters of the zohar is the son and disciple of rabbi shimon bar yochai is one of the one of the mystical gang, if you will, right, of this of this special fellowship of mystics who are wandering about uh, the Galil in in the imagination of these medieval Spanish mystics, right? So you have to see it's sort of like worlds within worlds. Um, but uh, but here our interest um, I, I, is a little bit more in terms of what we could call form criticism, as has been said, talked about in literary studies, right? So we're looking at the form of this text, right? How, what, what, how, how, how does it function? And 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 in that sense, let's let's think about it through through the through those those multiple lenses I was just mentioning, right? The the evocation of the mystical lyric of the sublime, right? How is this pushing us toward the sense of the sublime, the mysterious, the ineffable, right? Beyond language and so forth. Um, how is it using sound? How is it using image? And how is it using concept or thought? Okay. Um, um, right. Even, um, because uh, because because even even though it's it's odd to use someone like um, Ezra Pound in this context, just as it's um, uh, perhaps even odder to use um, someone like Martin Heidegger to study Kabbalah, um, that's uh, that that seems to be um, hap happening now and again these days, and it ha still has much to teach us and had had a big impact on literary studies, so it's it doesn't really help us to avoid it. Um, okay, um, is there someone who is feeling this passage, who is just, who really wants to recite this passage, it's, it, you've been waiting, you, I think, your, your whole life for this moment? I can start off. Great, Ron. Ron, Ron, is, Ron is my ringer. In the, yeah, there you go. It has been taught, Rabbi Elazar said, at the beginning of the first hour when day expires and the sun sinks, the master of keys who is appointed over the sun enters through the 12 gates that are open during the day. After he enters through all of them, all those gates are closed. A crier arises and begins to proclaim, the one who rises, rises and grasps those keys. When the Crier finishes, all the guardians of the world assemble and ascend, no one opening a portal, all calming down. At midnight, when birds awaken, the north side arouses with a wind. A scepter of the south side stands in its place and strikes that wind. It is then calm and fragrant. Okay, so um, I'm sure that that's 100% clear to everybody, right? Um, uh, I, I, I know I know I am not mystified at all by 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 that um, so uh, now there have been various attempts um, uh, some, some some by Matt and his commentary on this passage some by me and my analysis of this passage to make sense of all, some of the specifics of all of this 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 refers to this celestial aspect or this mythological piece that's a little bit that's that's not irrelevant 
but is 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 less significant for us here, right? So even even leaving aside the fact that like who is he talking about this? Who's the master? Who's the master of keys? Who's the what are these twelve, are the 12 gates? What are, so so even taking that stepping back from that for a moment, right? So let's just look at it in terms of lenses of analysis. Um, how is this right? And 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 just to say again, right? In the Zohar, you don't have standalone poems, right? Um, because it's all. And that's why we I would call it this kind of prose poetry, or even just poetry in general, right? I'll leave it a little bit more vague. Um, um, it's, right, it's 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 not it's not line break verse poetry in the classic sense. But what what's happening here? Right in terms of those modalities that I was describing before. Right, the first I'll just mention them again as you're absorbing this um, poem that is not a poem that is a poem. Oh dear. Um, right. Um, all right. What is happening here in the sense of? The text functioning as a lyric, a mystical lyric of the sublime, right? That mystifying, that attempt to achieve that experience, that aesthetic experience, that artistic experience of the sublime, right? That which is mystifying, which is other, which is ineffable. Um, Right, um, and um, and and by the way, a number a number of poets, and here I specifically have in mind um, uh, Robert uh, von ha Robert von Halberg, um, who was a scholar at the University of Chicago for a long time. Uh, then now I believe was in California. Wrote, wrote a very important book called um, Lyric Powers. Um, which is really a, a, a wonderful book um, studying the nature of lyric and of, and of, and of uh, lyricism in, in quite a clear way and also invoking a variety of different thinkers and poets, uh, including um, the way in which this was uh, understood by thinkers like uh, Hannah Arendt and, um, and then the poet John Crow Ransom and others, uh, and a different Polish poet, okay, but I digress. Um, okay, so how is it toward a lyric of the sublime? How is it the poetics of sound? How is it the poetics of imagery? And how is it the poetics of, of thought or mythology or um, ideas. Um, Kathy, I see um, not your virtual hand, but your real hand that is a vir that is virtual. So we're we're going to do all kinds of mystical mystifications. Right. Please. So, so there's very much sense here of the process of the day, and and the soul going through the day, and as you process through the day, you have these experiences that are then closed behind you. Mm. And then what might seem to be then the, the, uh, um, the most intense, then, and, and, and then and the birds come and the scepter and, and you have what, what, what seems to be um, uh, building to the most climactic that's the point where it all becomes uh, calm, fragrant and calm. Very so nice, yeah. Almost, yeah. Right? So there, there's almost like um, uh, a, a tension in that final, in those final moments of one's day. Yes, very, very, very nice observation, right? So, so it's, so it's, um, so, so the, the, the final culmination here of, um, the final culmination of the sunset, right? This 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 sinking of the sun, right? Um, um, and this kind of uh, um, um, right, a kind of uh, almost a kind of exhalation uh, in this kind of expo in the, when the, when 
then the day expires, Kad Nashaf Yamama, Ve'al Shimsha, right? It actually has that, has that texture uh, to it. Um, but there's also, right, so, so, the, so the, the, the final culmination of the sunset is there at midnight, right? This is when the birds awaken. I don't know whether the birds awaken at midnight. Karen will have to tell us. Um, uh, but the, but that's when the north side arouses a wind. The north side in the czar just to just to just to uh, grab a hold of the thought element of analysis is generally associated with the other side, um, the sitra achra, the demonic, the dark side. Um, for all you Star Wars aficionados. Um, the north, the north side, north wind. This, this, um, this also. I mean, this has a lot of background to it. In terms of how the north is associated with 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 uh, with Ra'a, and of course that has other biblical um, bases that are that are the archaeology of it, but not really entirely relevant to it, other than the fact that it's negative, right? Um, but as you note, as you note, right, there's, so there's, there's an arousal of the wind by the north side, uh, and then a scepter of the south side stands in its place and strikes that wind. So there's almost like a kind of, kind of clash or, um, right, an attempt to rise up the, the winds on the part of um, the demonic side or the dark side. Um, right, the Zohar uh, being written in the Middle Ages was a big believer in de uh, demonology. Um, so um, perhaps you are too, but, but they were, they lived in the 13th century. Um, it strikes that wind. And then as Kathy noted, right, then the, then the close of this poem that is not a poem, um, uh, right, or in terms of how we define the edges, right? It's, um, just as an aside, I, I had an interesting conversation with a scholar of poetry, a poet himself, who sort of was asked, was interrogating the question. We were talking about the question of, well, can we talk about Zoharic poetry? Can we talk about Zoharic poems? Um, if, is, there, is, there a, is there some sort of shape to them, right? Is there a beginning? Is there an end? Uh, is it, is it um, right, poesis means the made thing. And then and so there's a kind of intentionality on the part of the artist, um, right? If we're looking at this as the, the mystical artist, right? But the culmination is this, that is calm and fragrant. And, and so, there, so, there's, so there's also, you also see here, I think, uh, another element of this, um, this uh, let's call it a poem, right? Um, is the use of senses, of different senses, right? So of, um, right, of fragrance of the olfactory. It's also of the, of the visual, and it's also, and it's also the crier, and 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 and, the, and, and that and that grand um, sound. Um, uh, what what else do you see, uh, Ruth? Please. Yes. I, it makes me think of the oh uh, uh, you have to uh, unmute uh, you have to unmute yourself uh, okay the yeah. heavenly gates uh, at Naila we just had the gates are open and then they close nice would you explain that please yes right so so um but after after this uh, master of keys enters through all of them, right? So these are the twelve gates that are open during the day. So this master of keys, who presumably, right, that means he's able to open and close the gates of the day. So he's opening and he's closing. He's closing the gates of the day, right? So so it's such a kind. Of, it really is a kind of metaphor. Is a kind of symbolic uh, language. Right. That so so the uh, the darkness that is coming, that is approaching, is here characterized. Actually, as this uh, right, he enters through them, and then those gates are closed. Presumably, the implication being, 
I think, right? That there is a kind of progressive darkness as the sun sinks, right? It's you know, presumably it's it's um, uh, does that mean it's 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 sinking into the water? Uh, there there are other examples where uh, where the uh, mystic friends um, watch the sunset over the Sea of Galilee. Um, so there's a kind of um, particular uh, poignancy uh, to that. Um, but there's but 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 there's a kind of there's a kind of mystifying nature to the to the rhythm of this right that this this and presumably this happens day after um, day after uh, day uh, but but the but the process that that happens right there's this there's this wailing there's this crying out from of the celestial of this celestial crier right um, that eventually then leads to this progress Calm, this progressive, progressive darkness, this progressive sinking and expiring of the sun. Um, right, the gates that are open during the day are then closed. The striking up of the wind, right, with the with 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 the coming of night, and then the calmness and the fragrance all um, all around. Right, so there's so there's there's all these different sounds happening, different sensations, different image, different images, different um, rather mysterious and um, elliptical, enigmatic perhaps, uh, elements of the drama, um, which is, which, which perhaps could be, ex right, to, to some, sometimes the authors of the Zohar um, are, are are uh, elaborating upon uh, clear structures of the metaphysical realm, and sometimes we, it feels like they're kind of just riffing on portraiting something in their imagination. Um, I want I want I want to show you uh, just since we're since since uh, we're we're pretty we're close to out of time. I just want to I just want to show us one. Um, one other really interesting passage here, which is number three, um, just to give you another sense of, of another way in which the poetry functions. There'll be, there'll be a lot more for us to study. We spent, spent a good amount of time uh, this first session, of course, with some introductory reflections. Um, so the first, the first number of lines in, involve uh, there's this, this a visitation of heavenly messengers to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and uh, right, that's that's what's happening in those first two boxes, um, and it's and and there's a kind of there's a kind of uh, process of they, they they teach him certain mysterious matters, and he's meant to write them down, but then he essentially try then he essentially engages in this process of trying to stir his muse. Right. This this is a kind of poem to the muse of Torah. Um, so so as he says, right? They said they said take this document, and this candle, and write these matters down. And we'll come back to you. So he sits down. He groans. He weeps. He's overwhelmed, and then he stirs himself to a kind of poetic soliloquy. Um, who who would read for us? Uh, starting with he opened and said from Proverbs five nineteen. Can't make Ron do it all. Give somebody else a chance. Ah, yes, Lee, please. I just have to uh, unmute yourself. Perfect. Uh, <clears throat> he opened and said, Proverbs 519, a loving doe, a graceful mountain goat, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be infatuated with love of her always. Torah, Torah, light of all the worlds, how many seas, rivers, fountains, and springs flow forth from you to every direction. Everything comes forth from you. Those above and those below stand upon you. The supernal light goes forth from you. Torah, Torah, what shall I say before you? You are a loving doe and a graceful mountain goat. Those above and below are your lovers. 
who will merit to suckle from you in the proper way? Torah, Torah, the delight of your master, who is able to reveal and to speak your secrets and mysteries? So, so, uh, so we'll 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 we'll, pa we'll pause there. There's there's more of it, but and, and, we'll, and we'll come back to this to unpack it more deeply since we're since I I, I, th I think the word we're, we're just a few minutes past our time. But just to just to just to gesture toward this a little bit. What are some initial thoughts and observations that we have here? Is a little less enigmatic than the first one, right? Uh, but it's but it's 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 a it's a different kind of embedded poem. Um, utilizing the language of Mishle, but also the language and imagery of Shir Hashirim, of Song of Songs, right? Um, uh, what, what, do, what, do, what, do, what do you see here in terms of lenses of analysis or anything else that you wanted to, to add? Lee, please. There, there's personification uh, of the Torah. I mean, nice. it almost sounds wrong to call it that because he addresses Torah as a lover. Uh, so very deeply erotic and uh, using the uh, language from uh, the Proverbs verse. Um, and as you said, really uh, using it uh, as Song of Songs and uh, talking about Torah as the delight of your master, presumably God, and uh, yeah, just very filled, filled with the, the natural world pointing to uh, the spiritual world. Be beautiful, yes, absolutely, right? So how many seas, rivers, fountains, and springs flow forth from every direction, right? So it's kind of the, it's the source, Torah is the, is the, is the source of all this overflowing natural energy, and Torah is the lover of the Kabbalistic interpreter, right? A lover and beloved. Torah is... Um, Torah is the muse, right? There's kind of this, there's also this, we talk about the musicality of it and the rhythm in, in terms of its cadence and rhythm, right? We see this, oraita, oraita, Torah, Torah, right? Um, first light of all the world and the visual, and then what shall I say before you? And then Torah, how can I speak your, your secrets and mysteries, a kind of stirring up of, the muse of Torah to be able to speak the mystical um, uh, secrets. Um, I see a uh, hand of uh, of Dr. Mona Fishbane, and then and then I think we're I think, I think we're five minutes past, right? So we we should probably. Oh, I talk fast. <laughs> I just wanted to point out the imagery of light, which is coming uh, across here. Um, the, the, in the very beginning, uh, holy, pious one, light of the world light of the world, take this candle and document. And then I, I did peek ahead to the next page where we talk this a lot about light. So I'm intrigued at how that's all gonna come together in this. Wonderful, fantastic, uh, thank you. And, and, and um, in, in some ways, and maybe we'll close with, with this thought, right? And we can pick up with this next time. Uh, in, some, in some ways, right? The very, very name of what came to be called the Zohar, right? It wasn't originally called the Zohar when it was, um, hot off the printing press because the printing press didn't exist yet, right? So it was, uh, um, but but it came to be called the Zohar, right? The the illumination, the and uh, the this kind of the shining light of God and and imagery of light. God as this ultimate being of light, and then therefore those who contemplate and experience God are enlightened. They are illuminated. Um, but light and the play of light and darkness are clearly deep parts of this poem, this muse to the wisdom of Torah. Um, right. So we're uh, we're at eight thirty to nine thirty. So we're 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 a little, we're just a little bit past, right? Uh, so we'll, so we'll um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll leave it to Ron to close. Uh, but uh, but just to <laughs> say we'll we'll <laughs> Uh, if, if you want, Ron, uh, it, but we'll um, we'll return to this particular um, uh, poem 
uh, next time and, and continue to delve into the material um, further. I don't know if you want to say anything, Ron, or not. No, that's it. I hope to see everybody next week. Tell your friends to come too. They can hop on board. And uh, hop, yeah. on, hop on the Zoha train. Yeah. There you go. Thank you very much. Very nice. My pleasure. Nice learning with, with all of you and hope to see you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi Paskin.